Welcome to this NPTEL lectures on dynamics and control of mechanical systems. My name is Ashitava Ghoshal and I am a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Center for Product Design and Manufacturing and also in the Robert Bosch Center for Cyber Physical Systems, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Till now we have looked at kinematics and dynamics of mechanical systems. From now onwards, we will look at the control of mechanical systems. In these lectures, we will first introduce the topic of control. Then we will look at state space formulation for control of mechanical systems. And in the last lecture, we look at the solution of state equations. So first lecture is on introduction. So till now in kinematics, we have looked at position and orientation of a rigid body in 3D space. We have also looked at rigid multi-body systems connected by joints. And we saw that it could be in the form of a serial chain or in a parallel configuration with loops. For Parallel configurations, we found that there were holonomic constraints or loop closure equations. And there were also, in some examples, we looked at non-holonomic constraints, which are basically constraints related to the velocities of the rigid body. We also looked at velocity and acceleration of rigid bodies in 3D space. In dynamics, we looked at the motion of a rigid body or a rigid multi-body system in 3D space due to externally applied forces and or moments. We obtained the equation of motion of rigid multi-body systems using Newton-Euler formulation and Lagrangian formulation. The equations of motion for rigid multi-body systems were basically second order nonlinear ordinary differential equations or ODEs. These equations of motion could be solved numerically in state space form. I also showed you some computer tools which can be used to derive the equations of motion and also model and simulate rigid multibody systems. So for a given external force and or moment, the motion is determined by the kinematics and equations of motion. In, in a sense, this could be called the natural dynamics of a rigid body or a rigid multibody system. So let us look at an example. This is an example of very simple example of a mass M in which there's an external force F which is acting from left to right the mass is at a distance x from some reference and it has an acceleration x double dot. So the motion of this mass subjected to an external force is given by this equation of motion, which is F equals ma. Everybody knows this. It is very simple, straightforward. So this is m d2x by dt square. So for an assumed force of one Newton, mass of 1 kg, we can integrate this equation once to obtain x dot, which is x dot 0 plus t. And then we can integrate once more to obtain x of t is x 0 plus x dot 0 t plus half t square. So for some initial conditions x 0 and x dot 0, which are assumed to be known, we can obtain the motion of this mass, which is basically x of t. So as you can see, the velocity of this mass, which is x dot, increases with time. And the position of this mass, which is x of t, is a parabolic function of time. So in this example, we have assumed x dot 0 is 0, and x dot x of 0 is also 0. So we can plot this. So this looks like this parabola, which is x of t is half t square. So it looks like this. But suppose we want this mass to have a constant speed. Okay. So right now, the speed is increasing with time. So 
this is the position which is parabolic so if i were to plot x dot it will be a linear okay but what i want is that the velocity should be constant speed right so what i want is x of t to be linear so i want x of t to be linear like this so is it possible to ensure that this mass has a constant speed okay not a speed which is increasing with time and this natural dynamics can be altered by a controller this is what i will show you in the next slide so the key idea is the following we have a dynamical system okay which is given by f of t equals m dv d of velocity with time okay so the input to this dynamical system is this force which could be a function of time and the output is the velocity so what we are going to do is that we will measure this velocity of this mass and feed it back okay so what do we mean by feed it back we will have some desired velocity remember we want the velocity to be constant so we measured the velocity and we feed it back and what this feedback is doing is we will subtract the desired minus the measured so vd minus vt and then we will multiply this difference by some number by some constant kp and the output of this block is the force so this is a closed loop control system where a force is acting on the dynamical system due to the action of the force the mass will start to move and we are going to measure the velocity and then we will find the difference between the velocity which we measure and what we want and then we are going to multiply by some constant and the output of this controller will be the force so the key idea in control is we measure the motion of the mass m by a sensor and this could be lots of different types of sensors it could be an imu or a gps we denote the measured velocity as v we feed back the measured velocity and compare with the desired velocity which is vd of t and we modify the input force to this mass as kp into vd minus v where vd is the desired speed so for a proper choice of kp okay i will show you that this measured velocity will approach vd so remember the natural dynamics was that if i apply a force to this mass the velocity will co continue to increase the position vector was parabolic so the derivative of the position vector was a something like c into t or some constant into time so it would increase with time but what we want is that the velocity which we want this mass to have should be constant so v of d will be a constant number so for this kp equal to 1 remember there is a block here which is kp we will go over this much later in more detail this is sometimes called as the proportional constant so kp as 1 and we want vd to be 5 meters per second constant so these numbers have been picked to show that we can design something or we can have a controller which will ensure that the mass has a constant speed okay and then we can plot this v as a function of time so again we will come to later how we can plot the output as a function of time for a closed loop system like this or a feedback system like this but let's for the moment assume that we can simulate this system and we can find what is v as a function of time okay so we can plot this so this is x dot or v and what you can see is that actual 
velocity will slowly increase and approach this desired velocity which is 5 meters per second and with as it as the time is increasing so somewhere after 5 seconds or you can say 6 seconds the velocity of this mass is now 5 meters per second approximately so we can plot what is the desired velocity which is this dotted line and we can simulate this system and find out what is the actual output of this system which is v of t okay so this is very good it's amazing because the natural dynamics was not a constant velocity but now we have ensured that we can get a constant velocity so there must be some you know payback it cannot be free so it requires external energy to achieve this desired velocity and that we can see from the plot of this force versus time okay so remember in the initial case we had force of 1 newton and that is what was giving this steadily increasing velocity and the position was a quadratic function half t square but now what you can see is in order to achieve this constant velocity we have to apply a different force so we need to apply 5 newtons and then eventually it will go to zero once this velocity has been achieved once it is going at constant speed of 5 meters per second we do not need to apply any more force okay so it is nothing is free so to achieve this desired characteristic or the desired dynamics of this simple mass we need to apply external energy which is varying with time so the general control system okay looks like this so we have a controller then we have a desired trajectory which is r of t in the previous example the desired trajectory was 5 meters per second okay then the output of the controller is u of t this is sometimes also called as the actuator input to the system okay so we have to apply some force or later on we'll see we have to apply some voltage to this dynamical system and then the dynamical system will respond and we'll get an output which is y in any control system we can also have something called t d of t so this is the disturbance which is coming from the environment onto the dynamical system and as shown in the previous slide we can measure this output and we can feed it back to the controller so this r of t is sometimes also called as the reference input or it is the desired trajectory the output or the actual trajectory of the system is denoted by y of t and we need to measure this output and using a sensor so we have to sense this output we have to measure it and then we have to feed it back into the controller so the controller inputs are the desired trajectory or the reference input the feedback which is y of t okay and the output of the controller is u of t which is typically like some kind of a force or voltage which will go into the actuator of the dynamical system so this dynamical system is also sometimes called as a plant so we have a controller we have measurements we have disturbance and this is called the plant So as I said, T D of T is denotes a disturbance to the plant. So the goal of control is to ensure that the dynamical system follows a desired trajectory. So as an example, I showed you a mass in which a force is being applied will follow some trajectory which is the parabolic. Okay? X of T is parabolic but we want to ensure that the dynamical system follows a desired trajectory more so in spite of this external disturbance t of d so even if there is an external disturbance 
I would still like the output y of t to be close to the desired r of t. And secondly, we would also like this system to follow a desired trajectory in spite of internal parameter change. We will come and see later what do we mean by internal parameter changes. Sometimes a control system is also used to stabilize an unstable system. So we will formally define what is a stable and unstable system. But for the moment, intuitively, we know what is an unstable system. So if you give a small perturbation to the system, the position or the configuration of the system changes too much. That is called as an unstable system. However, if you give a small perturbation and it comes back to the place where you gave the perturbation, that is called as a stable system intuitively. But we will formally define what is stable and unstable and so on a systems later. Sometimes the goal of control is to also improve the performance of a system. So I could have a system where I want this constant speed of 5 meters per second, but I am only getting 4.5 meters per second all the time. I am not able to achieve exactly 5 meters per second or closer to 5 meters per second. So I can design a controller and we will see again all these things later, which will improve the performance of the system. So basically the error between what you measure and what you want can be decreased by again by control. So let's look at an example in much more detail about all these various concepts of and the goals of control. So we will take this example of a single link which is actuated by a DC motor. So this is a very, very standard example. So what we have is a DC motor, okay, and there is a link. So you can think of this as one of the joints uh, driving a link in a robot or some other mechanism. It could be as, or it could be even simpler as something like a motor which is driving the blades of a fan. Okay, so we have this motor, it is applying some torque Tm and then the output shaft of the motor starts rotating and we will denote the rotation of the motor shaft by theta m, m stands for motor. And then this motor is typically connected to the link by means of gearboxes. Okay. So we normally never ever connect a motor directly to the output shaft of the, or the output shaft to the link. So if you have a gearbox, we will assume that there is a pair of gears. It need not be in a single stage, but we will assume that it is in a single stage as far as this modeling and analysis is concerned. So there is some N1 teeth at the input and there is an N2 teeth at the output. And the output also shaft rotates by theta L. Okay, we will also assume that in the input shaft there is some friction Fm and the rotational inertia of this input shaft is Jm. Similarly, the output shaft has an inertia of Jl and there are some friction at these bearings and various other places or maybe even in the gears of Fl. Okay, and one more final symbol, which is TL. So we could have some torque which is acting on this link, which is denoted by TL. So with these symbols, now we are ready to model this system. So the purpose is I will like to model this system, then analyze this system, and then eventually show how we can control the motion of this link. And we can show all the nice features of control, how the control can achieve a desired trajectory in spite of internal parameter changes, in spite of external disturbances and various other things, okay? So as I said, this is a single link driven by a DC motor through a gearbox. And this is a very nice reason why we need a gearbox. 
So typical rated speed of a DC motor is maybe let's say 2000 RPM. Okay, we need about only 60 RPM. Okay, why do we need 60 RPM? So 60 RPM is something like one rotation per second. Okay, whereas 2000 RPM is much, much higher. So if you connect a link of a motor, which is let's say one meter, so then if you have 2000 RPM, you can compute the speed at the tip of this link. It will be very, very high. But typically in a robot or something like that, we want this tip speed to be let's say one or a few meters per second. So we cannot connect a 2000 RPM motor to a link. So 2000 RPM is say 30 rotations per second, right? And 30 rotation means 30 into 2 pi. So that is something like 30 into 6. Let's assume pi is 3. So that is 180 radians per second. Okay, and if it is one meter, okay, long, so then it is 180 radian into one, which is 180 meters per second. The tip speed will be that. Whereas we need much, much smaller. We need maybe one or five meters per second. So we need to reduce the speed. So we must have a gearbox. And this is typically seen in many, many uh, robots and many other systems where we have some kind of a gearbox to reduce the rated speed of a DC motor. So most of the times this speed reduction cannot be achieved in one stage. But for the purpose of this analysis, we will assume that it is done by a single stage with two spur gears having teeth N1 and N2. Okay, so this theta of the output or the theta of the link divided by the theta of the motor is n and n is much smaller than one. Okay, so as I showed you, if you have 180 meters per second and we need, let's say, one meter per second, this n will be one by 180. So it is much smaller than one. So once we have this, you know, arrangement, and some simple calculations. We can now derive the equation of motion of this gear one. So what is the equation of motion of this gear? We have done lots of dynamics throughout this course till now, and it is it should be familiar to everybody. It will be like Jm into theta m double dot. So this is like I into alpha plus some Fm into theta m dot. So this is like friction. And then T1 is the torque which is acting between these two gear teeth. So this is like a reaction torque, okay? And this T1 is the torque which is acting on this part from this part at the where the teeth are meshing. And this will be equal to the torque which is supplied by the motor. Okay, so Jm, Fm, Tm are the inertia of the motor, viscous friction at the motor shaft, and torque output of the motor. So T1 denotes the torque acting on gear one from gear two. So gear one and gear two, okay, and the link. So this is like the reaction torque. We can also find the equation of motion of this link plus gear two. So it is again very simple. It is some JL into theta L double dot. So this is like JL is the uh, inertia of this output shaft theta L double dot is the angular acceleration of the output shaft plus FL theta L dot. This will be equal to T2 plus TL. And what is T2? T2 denotes the reaction torque which is acting on this part from this first gear. Okay, so it is T2 denotes the torque transmitted to gear two by gear one. And TL, as I had mentioned, it could be some external disturbance torque which is acting on this link. So we have these two equations. We have one which is relating the gearbox. So this entire system has one degree of freedom, right? So whatever you do here, you can easily relate this output link to the motor shaft. 
whatever is happening at the motor shaft. So we have two differential equations and we have one relationship between theta L and theta M. We also need one more relationship, which is how is T1 and T2 related? Once we have these things, I can derive the equations of motion of this entire system. So in order to relate what is T1 and T2, we'll make this assumption that there is no energy loss at the gear tooth contact. So which is what? That T1 into theta m is T2 into theta l. So T1 into theta m is the work done okay, by T1 by rotating the motor shaft by theta m. And that should be equal to T2 into theta l. So there is no loss at the gear tooth contact. So once we have this equation and also the relationship between theta L and theta M, we can get rid of theta L. We can also get rid of T1 and T2 and then derive the equation of motion. So this, you can do it. It's very easy. All you need to do is follow a few steps and do some simplification. And then you can derive the equation of motion of the system. It's a one degree of freedom system. So it must have only one equation of motion. And this is the equation of motion. What it tells you is we have some Jm, which is the inertia of the motor, plus n square into Jl, which is the inertia of the link, into theta m double dot, plus Fm, which is the friction at the motor shaft, maybe at the bearings of the motor. Fl is the friction at the link, which is, and this is multiplied by n square. So this into theta m dot is Tm plus NTL. Okay, so again, this you can, you should be able to do it. It is very simple. It requires a few steps. So what are some of the observations? N is small, remember? N is like one by 100, roughly, or even smaller. So if n is small, what is happening is you are multiplying JL by n square. So what it means is the inertia of the load is not seen by the motor. Okay, So it is reduced by a factor of n square. And if n is 1 by 100, then n square will be 1 into 10 to the power 4. So very little of the inertia is seen by the motor. Likewise, the effect of the external disturbance TL is also reduced by a factor of n. So the motor does not see what is the external disturbance which is coming on the link as it is rotating. We can also find out a model of the motor. Okay, so this is a very standard well-known model of a DC servo motor. Basically what we have is a coil, which is typically the stator. And then we have a rotor, which is normally a permanent magnet. Okay, so the stator can be modeled by a resistance RA. We can also have some kind of an inductor or inductance LA. Okay, there is a voltage which is being applied. And then once you apply the voltage, the motor shaft starts rotating with theta m dot. So that is the speed of the motor shaft. So most of the time nowadays, the rotor is a permanent magnet, a rare earth material, which has very high uh, magnet, magnetic properties. And then the stationary armature has coils which have resistance RA and LA. So this is a typical model of a permanent magnet DC servo motor. When you apply a voltage to this stator, there is a current which starts flowing in this circuit and we can denote this current by Ia. So basically this is the armature current. The torque generated by this motor when a current is flowing in the stator is proportional to the current. So Tm is Kt times Ia. So KT is constant. There is also a back EMF which is generated when the rotor starts rotating at some speed theta m dot. 
and the voltage which is the back emf is kg times theta m dot okay and this kt and kg these are called the torque and back emf constants and these are typically available if when you buy a motor it comes with the motor specifications the dynamics of the motor can be written the electrical part can be written as the voltage drop across the resistance plus the voltage drop across the inductance plus the voltage drop due to the back emf will be equal to the applied voltage which is what is written here so it is la into ia dot the voltage drop across the inductor is proportional to the rate of change of the current with time and this is the voltage drop across the resistance very well known i into r and this is the voltage drop due to the back emf and this is equal to voltage applied so for small dc servo motors la is small and we can drop this term okay and hence we can write remember the right hand side was torque so kt times ia but ia can be written as va minus kg into theta m dot divided by ra so this is kt into i plus n into tl the left hand side remains as it is so we have something into theta m double dot plus something into theta m dot but there is also one more term which is coming which is theta m dot okay that is the back emf and finally we can simplify and rewrite this equation as a first order differential equation so we are going to make a bunch of substitutions one is the theta m dot will be written as this capital omega so what is this this is j into omega dot and what is j j is jm plus n square jl likewise this is fm plus n square fl is written as capital f okay but when you pull this theta m dot this side so you will have fm plus n square fl plus kt into kg divided by ra okay so this is in some sense like a dissipative term remember in a motor when you apply a current there is heating at the coils and there is some dissipation so this friction and this dissipation they all sort of come together so this is f into omega because theta m dot is omega and then we have kt so kva by ra okay so kt by ra we'll call it as k and this n into tl we'll call td so once we make all these substitutions we have a first order differential equation which is j into omega dot plus f into omega is equal to k v a plus t d note that this j f k they are constants so this equation here with all these substitutions is describes the mechatronic behavior of a single link robot or a single link being driven by a dc servo motor okay so the dynamics in terms of angular velocity so this is the differential equation it's an ode which is written in terms of the angular velocity of the of the motor okay so remember omega is theta m dot and it also includes the effect of the back emf it also includes the effect of friction and inertia so what you can see from this equation is that this link will rotate if i apply a voltage the link will also rotate if there is no voltage but there is a disturbance torque so you can think of this link as one of the blades of a fan so one way this fan blade will rotate is if you switch on the switch okay if you apply some current if you apply some voltage the other way is you, th there is no voltage being applied but i can hit the blade with some other stick or something and then again it will start rotating so in this expression it tells you that there are two possible inputs okay one is the voltage and one is the external disturbance torque and the output is omega 
So how do we analyze this ODE? So in control theory, one very well-known or standard way is using Laplace transform. So what is a Laplace transform? It basically converts an ordinary differential equation into an algebraic equation in S. Okay, so where S is known as the Laplace uh, variables. Okay, so what is the Laplace transform of f of t, some function which is in time domain t, it is called f of s. And it is defined as f of s is 0 to infinity f of t e to the power minus st dt. So I am assuming that you, know, you are familiar with this Laplace transform, how to go from time domain or f of t to f of s. Okay, nevertheless, here are some very simple results which we will use okay, for Laplace transform. Please go and review and revise Laplace transform from some basic mathematics course, which you must have done. So one of the important results is that if you have s into f of s and you do s tends to infinity, this will give you f of zero. This is also called the initial value theorem. Likewise, if you have s into f of s and you have s tending to zero, so s tending to zero is same as t tending to infinity. So we have limit of t tends to infinity f of t. This is also called the final value theorem. Another very, very useful result in Laplace transforms is that if you differentiate a function m times. So f to the power mt means you are going to differentiate this f of t m times. Okay. So if you differentiate it m times, the after doing this Laplace transform, you will get this thing, which is s to the power m f of s minus s to the power m minus 1 f of 0, then s to the power m minus 2 f dot of 0, and so on, minus f to the power m minus 1, 0. So f to the power m minus 1 is the m minus 1th derivative of this function, and 0 means the initial value of that m minus 1th derivative. So this is the way to differentiate as many times as you want a function of time, and you will get this uh, form. Okay, The Laplace transform is s to the power m f of s plus all these terms which depends on the what is the initial conditions okay at t equals 0 what is the first derivative what is the second derivative and so on we can also integrate a function f of psi d psi and that is given by 1 by s f of s plus some f dot of t dt divided by s evaluated at t equals 0 Okay, so these two functions are very useful. One is that suppose I want to take the derivative of f of t, it is s f of s. Okay, if I want to integrate a function once, I'll get 1 by s f of s. A few common Laplace and inverse Laplace transforms are following. One is if f of s is 1, then f of t is the Dirac delta function, delta of t. If f of s is 1 over s, f of t is 1. Okay, if f of s is 1 over s square, f of t is t. And if f of s is a divided by s square plus a square, f of t is sin a t. And if f of s is s divided by s square plus w square, it is cos, uh, so this should be a, so this is cos a t. Okay, so we can also obtain the inverse Laplace transform for something like s plus a divided by s plus a whole square plus b square. So then you'll get e to the power minus at cos bt. And if you have a square plus b square divided by s into s plus a whole square plus b square, you'll get 1 minus e to the power minus at cos bt plus a by b sin bt. Okay, so these are some very standard forms of Laplace transform and what is the inverse Laplace transform. Okay, so please 
go back and revise if you want to. Uh, we are not going to go very deeply into Laplace transform, but whatever we need basically is given here, and maybe you can go back and revise. So what do we do with Laplace form transforms? So basically we will assume zero initial conditions and it will convert an ODE as a function of time into a polynomial in S. Okay. So for example, the ODE in this equation J omega dot plus F omega is KVA plus TD. Okay. In Laplace domain, it will be written as J S omega S plus F omega S equals K V A S plus T D into S. So omega dot became S omega S, but with zero initial condition. So most of the time in control theory or when we are doing S domain analysis of control systems, we will assume zero initial condition. Once we have these transforms, we can define something called as a transfer function. So the transfer function is nothing but the ratio of the output to input in Laplace domain. Okay, So we could have two inputs in that example which we were discussing of a link being rotated by a DC motor. So the two inputs are the voltage and the disturbance. Okay, So VAS and TD of S. So we can have two transfer functions. One of them is omega s divided by V a of s is k divided by j s plus f. The other is omega s divided by t d s is equal to 1 divided by j s plus f. So how did I obtain this? In order to obtain this first transfer function, we assume that the second input is 0. So basically what we have is omega s into here j s plus f is equal to k into v a of s. So we can write omega s by v a of s is k divided by j s plus f. Likewise, if you have omega s divided by t d of s, so when we are trying to obtain this transfer function between omega and t d, okay, omega is the output, t d is the input, v a is assumed to be 0. Okay, So hence we can get this. So 1 over Js plus F. Very straightforward. We can also describe all these transfer functions in what is called as a block diagram form. Okay. So what is the block diagram form? We have output omega S, input VAS, voltage applied. So what is the block diagram? It is K divided by Js plus F. So again, it is nothing but omega s divided by v of s is equal to k divided by j s plus f. This is a pictorial representation that I can have an input which is voltage, output which is speed, and then this block represents the transfer function which we have determined. Likewise, if the input is T d and the output is omega s, then the transfer function is put in this block. It is 1 divided by j s plus f. These are linear systems okay? because remember k, j, f, these are all constants. So if you have a linear system, you can add the two inputs. So I can have t d going into some block which is 1 by k. You can also have voltage which is coming in. Then we sum these two and then we send it together as inputs to this block, which is the transfer function, which is k divided by j s plus f, and this is omega s. So this is nothing but the equation in Laplace domain. So remember, omega into j s plus f was equal to k into v a plus t d. So that is exactly what you will get here. So if you have transfer functions and block diagrams in this form that there is an input and there is an output and there is a transfer function sitting in between, a block sitting in between, these are called open loop transfer functions. Okay, 
as opposed to what is called as a closed loop transfer function which is shown here. In this, what you have is this part here which is TD 1 by K VA and then K divided by JS plus F and output is omega S. But let's assume that this output can be measured by a sensor whose transfer function is 1. So the output of the sensor is again omega. So now we have omega D minus omega. So at this point we have omega D minus omega. So this circular block is nothing but a summation block. And summation here means that you sum the two inputs. One of the input is with a minus sign. So it is omega D minus omega. And you send the output of this summation block to a controller. So at the moment we will say that the controller has a transfer function of D of S. And then the output of the controller is this voltage Vs. So what you can see is I have taken this one, I have measured it, I have subtracted it here and sent to another block which I will, I am calling it the controller and the output of the controller is the voltage. Okay. So I hope this is clear that we could have a block diagram which is sometimes also called open loop transfer functions which denotes omega by V of V. So output by the input voltage is K divided by JS plus F. Whereas in some other form in basically in feedback control we also measure the output and then do some subtraction and then send it to a controller. In this case it is called closed loop. So let us con continue. So the goal of control, as I had mentioned earlier, is that we want to follow a desired trajectory in spite of external disturbances and in spite of parameter change. Okay. So let us see what happens when you have a open loop system. That means there is no feedback. There is no sensing and there is no uh, sending back the signal and then we are doing subtracting. So basically the signal which was coming from omega s is now broken. So we have omega d coming in. Output of this summation block is again still omega d and we are sending into the controller. And the output of the controller is v of a s. So the question is, this was remembered in the previous slide, d of s. So what can we choose as a controller transfer function? So the simplest thing that we can choose is a constant. Okay, so we can use this D of S as a constant because nothing can be simpler than that. So in the case of the closed loop system, again, we have measurement of omega and then we subtract this voltage, which the output of this is V of S is nothing but kp times omega d minus omega s. Okay, so omega d is the desired and this is the measurement. So notice in both of these I have removed the disturbance. So for the moment we will assume that the disturbance is zero. Okay, so we will do some simple analysis is to show that we can, the control system will function in right now in spite of internal parameter change. That is what we will look at first. We will also look at whether we can follow a desired trajectory with even if you have external disturbances. So as I said, in the controller transfer function block, we will start with a very simple controller, simplest possible controller, which is that the transfer function of that is a constant. There are two more things which I wanted to mention here that in steady state this dynamical system basically steady state means what t tends to infinity or s tends to zero. So what is the transfer function of this dynamical system as t tends to infinity? It is nothing but k by f. Okay. So and we are going to denote this k by f as k zero. 
Okay, so this is an example of a controller without feedback. This is a controller with feedback. This is the closed loop system. This is the open loop system. And we will use this symbol K0 to find what is the transfer function of this plant as t tends to infinity or s tends to 0. So one more assumption or one more way of looking at this that I can choose this controller gain whatever I want. Okay, so this is like an experiment, a thought experiment. However, there is a condition that you can choose KP as whatever you want, but once you have chosen it, you cannot change it. Okay, so KP, you know, in some factory, you do whatever tests you want, you do all trials, and you say, okay, I'm going to choose KP as 5 or 3.261, okay? But once you have fixed that KP, this constant, you cannot change it anymore. Then you will ship this controller to various places and see how it works. So that is the experiment which you want to do. So let's see what happens when you have open loop and no feedback. So when you have open loop and no feedback, you have omega d which is coming in, there is no feedback. So the output of the summation block is still omega d. This is kp and there is the output of this controller is voltage and we get this. Okay, so again with td equal to zero and in steady state, which means t tends to infinity or s tends to zero. So what is omega s as s tends to zero? It is k divided by js plus f into the voltage. Okay which is coming in. So what, what does this mean? As S tends to zero, this capital omega will be K by F into voltage. And what is this voltage applied? That is Kp into omega D. So what we have is K by F into Va, which is same as, remember K by F, we are going to denote by K zero. So then we have K0, Kp into omega D. So the output omega in steady state, that means as t tends to infinity, is given by K0, Kp, omega D. So what do you think is the best possible choice of Kp? Okay, so clearly it is 1 over K0. Remember, we are allowed to do as many experiments as you want. We are allowed to find out what is K, F, J, everything. And then we find out that this, you know, K0, which is K by F is some number. So I can go and tune this controller or I can set the value of Kp in the controller to one over K0. So if I were to do this, Kp as one over K0, then I'll get omega as omega D, you know, very nice that we can have a control system where the output is exactly the same as omega d, whatever I want, okay? So, right, this is the goal of the controller, that I would like the output to be whatever is the desired. And I can do this by setting this Kp as one over K0. So at least in steady state, after some time, may not be initially, not in the transient portion, in steady state, we will have the output, which is same as the desired quantity. Whatever is the desired speed, I will get the output as the desired speed. So this strategy is also sometimes called as inverting the plant, because what is the plant in steady state? K by F. And what, what am I going to do with Kp? It is one over K0. So I'm going to invert the plant and put it in the controller. We'll see later why this is not a good idea, okay? Or it is not a very, you know, very, very useful idea. So if you have closed loop with feedback, then what do we have? That this voltage which you are applying to this plant is Kp into omega d minus omega. So again, in steady state, we are going to assume that as s tends to zero, the plant is K by F, which is K0. Okay, so now for closed loop, this voltage 
is kp into omega d minus omega okay so we can see it is written here voltage applied is which is this is kp into whatever is coming into the block which is omega d minus omega so hence the in the limit s tends to zero the output omega s is k divided by js plus f okay into v of s so k into kp plus js plus f plus kkp so you can work this out you can see that voltage is given by kp into omega d minus omega you put that in the left hand side and then you simplify and then you obtain omega s so basically some part of you know will come here and then eventually what you can see is you will get omega is k0 kp into 1 plus k0 kp into omega d okay so when s tends to 0 this part will go away okay then you divide numerator and denominator by f so you will have 1 plus k0 kp and on the top we have k0 kp okay so the best possible choice now is that k0 kp is much greater than 1 so suppose k0 kp is 100 so i will choose k0 kp as so so if i have numerator as 100, 100 then 100 divided by 101 is very close to 1 okay so i would choose kp such that k0 kp is much much greater than 1 right so k0 is fixed so k0 is let's say uh, 5 so then i will choose kp as let's say 100 so then what do i have here so this is 500 divided by 501 which is very close to 1 so omega which is the output here will be approximately same as omega d so it looks like that we are not doing so well why because in the open loop omega was equal to omega d exactly because i chose kp as 1 over k0 okay whereas in the closed loop whatever you do this will be something divided by 1 plus something so it will be very close if this k0 kp is very large much larger than 1 but it will never be exactly equal to 1 okay so in closed loop we have omega which is approximately equal to omega d and this is the best that we can do so in a feedback control system with sensing and then this controller which has kp so i can at best choose k0 kp much much greater than 1 and hence the output omega will be approximately equal to omega d so this kind of strategy in feedback this is sometimes called as a high gain controller so i am going to choose kp a large number such that k0 kp is much much greater than 1 so let us continue let's see what we can achieve by doing this feedback okay so first thing is let us consider the open loop system and remember we have chosen kp as 1 over k0 okay so in the open loop system controller without feedback i have a desired omega desired speed this kp is 1 over k0 and then the output is the voltage which i am sending to the dynamical system and we have the speed which is the output of the link so let us assume that this k0 which was what was k0 k by f so let's assume that this k0 somehow changes to k0 plus delta k0 is that feasible yes because remember this friction has in a uh, you know ra which is the resistance in the coil it has the friction in the bearings so you could do all your simulations and studies and other things in one place and you send it to the deserts which is very high temperature in that case the resistance will change the friction will change so this k by f can change okay 
and let's assume that this k0 changes to k0 plus delta k0. So if you have an open loop system in the steady state where s tends to 0, then the output will change to omega plus delta omega and that will be given by k0 plus delta k0 into kp into omega d. Okay, so your k by f has changed from k0 to delta k0 and remember omega was k0 into kp into omega d. So now there will be an omega plus delta omega which is k0 plus delta k0 into kp into omega d. So since kp is set to 1 by k0, this delta omega will be delta k0 divided by k0 into omega d. Remember, we were doing this thought experiment that I can choose k0 whatever I want, but once I choose it, I cannot change it. So that is like a factory setting. So I have done lots of experiments and I had chosen kp as 1 by k0, but then I send it to somewhere else, this system, this rotating link, where the resistance of the coil or the friction has changed and k0 is changed. So then the output change, which is delta omega, is same as delta k0 by k0. Okay, so if my system changes by 5%, my output will change by 5%. Okay, let's now consider what happens when you have feedback. Okay, when you have feedback, then the voltage which you are applying is Kp into omega d minus omega. Okay, so for closed loop, we have K0, Kp much, much greater than 1. That is the way we chose it. Okay, so now when you have an x percent change in K0, you can show that you will get 1 divided by 1 plus k0 kp into x percent change in omega prime, okay, where omega prime is delta omega prime bus by omega prime is 1 divided by 1 plus k0 kp into delta k0 by k0, okay, this is what you will get. So, what is the moral of the story? That if I have a feedback and I have chosen K0, Kp as let's say 100, much, much greater than 1. So then, then an X percent change in delta K0 by K0 will be X divided by 101 percent change, okay, in the output speed. Okay, so what is the net result? The net result is that due to a change in the internal parameters of the system, the output is not affected much. The change is out in output is greatly reduced by feedback. Okay, and this means there's a term in control theory, it means it is giving you robustness in the sense that small changes in the internal parameters, small changes in K0 does not change the output too much. Let us continue. If TT were not to be zero, suppose we had some external disturbance, then again in the steady state, you can show that this omega will be K0 into some controller again. I'm intentionally using KC here, not KP into omega D plus K0 into TD by K. So this you can derive, okay? So if you have K0 into Kc as 1, okay, which is the open loop system, then omega will be omega d, but then you will have this additional term which is K0 into Td by k. So whatever change or whatever is the disturbance Td will be reflected directly in the output. Okay, so if Td were 0, then your omega is same as omega d, but if Td is some 
small changes in the speed, some disturbance, it will show up in the omega because it is omega d plus something into td. Okay. Whereas if you have feedback, then again the steady state output, which is s tending to 0, you can derive that omega is k0 kc divided by 1 plus k0 kc into omega d. So it is nothing but the same expression instead of kp. I am using kc here. But the term which is coming from the disturbance is k0 into 1 plus k0 kc divide into td by k. Okay, so k again was coming from the motor. Okay, so k and f they were coming from the mode, you know, model of the uh, link which is driven by a DC motor. So if you choose k0 kc to be much greater than 1, okay, and k0 kc to be much greater than k0 by k, another way of saying is I am going to choose kc much much greater than 1 over k, then the effect of this disturbance is also reduced. Okay. In open loop, what was I doing? I was choosing kc or kp as 1 over k. But now I need to choose kc, which is the controller gain, or kp, whichever what I was using earlier, as much, much greater than 1 over k. Okay. So then not only we can reduce the effect of the change in the internal parameter, which is k0, but also the effect of td. Okay. So hope, I hope you realize that I have shown you that with feedback, I can reduce the effect of the internal parameter changes and I can also reduce the effect of the external disturbances. Okay. I can reduce what is happening with k and f, which is k0. If that changes, then the output is not changing as much as k0, but k0 something divided by 1 plus k0 kc. Okay. Likewise, if you have a disturbance td which is acting on the system, again, by choosing the controller gain kc much, much greater than 1 by k, I can make sure that the disturbance is not seen in the output. Let's continue. As I said, one more purpose of controller is to stabilize an unstable system. So again, we will do these things in much more detail and rigorously later on. But right now I'm taking a very simple example. So this is a, what is called as an inverted pendulum. So I have a joint here, okay, a rotary joint, and then there is a rod and there is a mass and gravity is acting downwards. So for u equals zero, that means there is no input, okay, and the zero initial condition, okay, so we can show that theta of t is theta zero e to the power g by lt. Okay, where am I getting this from? So we take this inverted pendulum and we consider a very small motion about this theta equals zero. The equation of motion for a small theta is, what do we mean by small theta? We are going to use sine theta equals theta. Okay, is given by theta double dot is minus g by l theta that is given by tau by ml square that is equal to u of t. Okay, and for u equals 0, so it will be theta 0 e to the power g by l t. Okay, so hence, as long as theta 0 is not 0, even if it is a small number, so e to the power some positive number into time. So as time goes on, this theta of t will increase. So any small perturbation from the vertical, which is theta 0 equals 0, theta of t will increase with time. And this is what is called as an unstable system. We will discuss this stability and unstability business later, and we will give you a very formal definition of stability later. Okay, so now let us consider this u of t in this differential equation of motion as 
something like kp which is a constant into theta 0 minus theta so what is theta 0 minus theta so we are going to measure this theta and then we are going to subtract from theta 0 and then multiply it by kp so one part of u of t which is this torque okay remember u of t is tau divided by ml square so one part is that and i also want to add one minus kd into theta dot so what does this assume that i am going to measure theta i am also going to measure theta dot and this is the way i am going to compute u of t and i am going to send to the plant to my system so remember u of t is the output of the controller so once you have this then this ode which is this in inverted pendulum we have de derived the equation of a pendulum in the dynamics portion of this course okay so this is known earlier so then this ode becomes theta double dot is equal to theta into g by l this goes that side plus kp into theta 0 minus theta minus kd into theta dot and i will now solve this differential equation this is not very hard to solve in fact this is a linear equation we can solve it but nevertheless i want to try different values of kp and kd and i am going to numerically solve this differential equation and plot theta versus time okay and I'm going to show you that for some values of kp and kd this theta will not increase with time without kp and kd it is like this theta 0 e to the power g by lt so it will increase with time but with kp and kd it will not increase with time and if you accept this definition of stability that theta of t does not increase from theta 0 then it is considered to be stable then I will I can claim that this way of computing u of t is now stabilizing a system so the output of the controller which is u of t which is kp into this minus kd into theta dot will stabilize the unstable system and again I will show you plots that I can choose this kp and kd with different values and I can show you that the nature of the output in this case theta of t will be different for different kp and kd okay and which another way of saying is i can make i can change the performance of the system so i will show you in one case it is oscillating about what i want and in another case there is no oscillation so here is a plot of theta of t for again in this case we have chosen mass as 1 kg, L as 2 meters, Kp as 10 and Kd as 1.5. Okay, So I want this pendulum to remain vertical. So theta at t equals 0 is vertical. Then I give some small perturbation but I want to make it sure that it stays vertical. So theta 0, the desired theta should be 0. Okay, so in this case, for this kind of Kp and Kd, what you can see is that plot is oscillating, but eventually it is settling at theta equals zero. So the desired theta is this dotted line, dashed line, and the actual theta is this blue curve. Okay, and we can also plot the torque, which looks like this. So we need the motor needs to supply a torque which is changing with time but nevertheless initially it was theta as theta 0 into e to the power some constant into time it would con constantly increase with time here it is not increasing with time it is oscillating about 0 but more or less staying around 0 as i said i can choose a different value of kp and kd everything else remains same m is 1 kg l is 2 meters but now i increase kd to 5 okay and in that case i wanted theta 0 to be 0 and here as you can see there is no oscillation it within a very short time of about maybe 4 or 5 seconds it will settle at theta equals 0 and the torque also 
profile looks different. So what have I done? In the controller, I have changed this KP and KD. Okay, initially it was 10 and 1.5, now it is 10 and 5. And by changing this controller gains, we will see later this is called as the proportional gain and this is called as the derivative gain. That is what P and D sort of stands for. By changing these gains, I can make the system behave very differently. It is no longer the natural dynamics of the system. The natural dynamics of an inverted pendulum is that I give a small perturbation, it will fall and it will start oscillating here and it will go oscillate all over the place. Whereas here, by using this controller, which is basically I am giving some torque, which is related to the measurement of theta and theta dot, I can ensure that the pendulum is staying vertically all the time after some short time. Initially, there might be some transients or initially if the KD is smaller, it will oscillate, but eventually, but it should stay at theta equals zero. So in summary, the natural dynamics of a dynamical system is determined by the equations of motion, you know, F equals MA. So if I tell you what is F, I can at least conceptually find out what is A, and then I can integrate A to find velocity, and I can integrate again to find the position. I can plot position as a function of time. So same thing if it is rotating. If you have torque equals I alpha plus omega cross I omega, if I give you the torque, I can, and if I know the inertia, I can find omega, and from that omega, I can find the theta or some rotation angle. The natural dynamics can be changed by use of feedback control. I have shown you two examples, one which is a mass which is being pushed, and one which is this inverted pendulum. In both cases, the first, I can change the natural dynamics. In the first case, the position would increase quadratically, like in the form of a parabola, but I wanted the velocity to be constant, not increasing with time, and I could do that. Similarly, with the case of this inverted pendulum, I can make it stand vertically. The goal of control is to obtain a desired performance of a dynamical system in spite of changes in internal parameters, in spite of external disturbances. Okay, and this I have shown you that it is possible to do so. Okay, and feedback control helps in both of these that the effect of feedback is to reduce the effect of the changes in the internal parameters and to reduce the effect of the external disturbances. In controls, we need to have sensors. We need to measure the output and then feed it back. The feedback control with high controller gain can achieve the goal of control. So, it can be robust to internal parameter change and external disturbance. I showed you that. And feedback can also be used to stabilize an unstable system. And I can use feedback to change the performance of a system.